Welcome to Science on Saturday. I'm Joanna Albala. I'm the manager of the science education program at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And I'm happy to see all of you here for our presentation this morning. So Science on Saturday is brought to you in partnership between the laboratory and the Livermore Valley Unified School District. And today we are lucky enough to have a board member, Chuck Rogi, here to introduce our presenters to you today. Chuck? Good morning. Welcome to the third presentation of Science on Saturday. Last week's topic was producing green energy with uh, light and wind. I hope you all be, were able to make that. Our topic today is back underground, though, the hydrology of an ant farm. When a farmer drills for water, where does that water come from and why? Today's speakers will give us an insight on how groundwater interacts with our environment and may affect our ecosystem and our daily lives. Dr. Andrew Thompson, along with science educator Aaron McKay, will discuss how the climate changes and pollution interacts with the water under our feet. Dr. Thompson is a hydrologist in the Atmospheric, Earth, and Energy Division at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. His research interests include physics of float, fluid flow, chemical transport, chemical transformation in porous media, fluid mechanics, groundwater supply and contamination, and the mathematical modeling of all these processes. Some of Dr. Thompson's published papers include analysis of subsurface contaminant migration and remediation using high-performance computing, and impacts of physical and chemical heterogeneity. Sorry, I'm just going to move on because I'm not going to say it right. On co-contaminant transport in a sandy porous medium. Erin McKay teaches biology at Tracy High School where she takes part in extra activities like the Wakesman Student Scholars Program, Biotechnology, and the Science Olympiad. Erin has participated in many of the past Science on Saturday presentations and helped organize and instruct the Student Scholar Program at Lawrence Livermore Labs Teacher Research Academy. So please welcome Andy and Erin. Got to have a little water before we get going. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thanks uh, for coming out. And uh, today's uh, talk will be about water and groundwater. Um, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about, in general, where does our water come from in California? Where does it go? And you know, what is groundwater? How does it all fit into this? Perhaps a lot of you've heard about that from the news and the drought we're having and that sort of thing. And so. Uh, I want to sort of discuss how important it is to our water supply and how we can protect it in the future. So the, the way I want to try to do this is to use this physical model you can see over here. We're going to go to that a couple of times and look at how things work in it. And it's not really an ant farm. There's no ants or anything. It's just kind of a little toy name I like to use to make you think about what it might look like. And it's a sort of a cross section of the earth. And we'll talk about that you know, in a second. So when we think about where our water comes from, um, you know, we, we are, our, you know, our minds go, well, it rains, our, our water comes from the rain and the snow. And we live in California, and that's, that's true. Uh, it's part of the hydrologic cycle. And that's, you know, where water is, evaporates off the ocean, and it goes up into the sky and forms clouds and large bodies of vapor up in the sky. And it, uh, in, in good years, it come over, come, blows over California and it rains and snows. And bad years, it goes north, it does nothing here. But, uh, that's in general how it works. And then it, it rains or precipitates out and then people will use the water, it goes under the ground, it runs off in streams. It will go underground as well. Sometimes it will go off into the ocean. And then it may re-evaporate. So that's the hydrologic cycle. It's worth noting that there's uh, some places in the world that get their water from outside the hydrologic cycle. You know, Saudi Arabia, and the Middle East, Kuwait, uh, the Gulf states, they rely totally on desalination of ocean water. And here they're actually sucking the ocean water out and are purifying it and drinking that. That's not part of the hydrologic cycle. There's another places in the world where I think I've got it uh, called fossil water. They mine the water. So it's water that's it's there from a previous climate and they're mining it out. When it's gone, it's gone. And I'll show you an example of that. And then uh, there are also places where we actually 
instead of discharging the water or wastewater back to the ocean, we actually treat it and recycle it and reuse it. And sometimes we just keep, we invent a new cycle doing this. So um, going back to California, uh, you know, all of our water, uh, all the precipitation that, that gives our water, most of it just falls in the state proper, you know? And you say, well, that's, that makes sense, but a lot of places, that's not the case. So 95% of the water in California that uh, is used is actually falls in precipitation. And the other 5% is uh, what we call imported water. And you say, well, what does that mean? And we, you know, a lot of water in Southern California comes from the Colorado River. And that's water that is, uh, falls as precipitation up in the Colorado River watershed in Colorado and flows in. So uh, in, in California, and there's a picture here of the, uh, the annual average precipitation over the last 30 years. And what you can see is most of the precipitation falls up north in the blue areas, and very little uh, falls in the southwest part of the state in the deserts area. And that, you know, I think we all understand that. So it also always, you know, it, it primarily falls in the winter. So in the summer, it's pretty much dry everywhere. And it's always dry in the south. And the only time we have a lot of wetness is most of it's up north. Um, million in the winter. So if you, you can think of the, the, the water equation in terms of uh, the inputs uh, get moved into storage or they get turned into outputs. It's a sort of a basic, it's like your bank account. You, have an, a, you make money, you earn money, you put it in a savings account or you pay off your expenses. And so if you lose your job or you're not getting as much money, you have a drought, then you're going to be living off of your, you know, your expenses are always the same. So you got to live off of storage. So we're going through these cycles with water in California right now. Uh, so most of the water uh, in, in California that falls, two-thirds of it goes away right away uh, as, as evaporation. Or as I think the word here is evapotranspiration. Transpiration is when the plant root zones pull the water in and it goes off into the atmosphere. Uh, this is in forests and trees, all plants, grass. It's a very significant process. And in fact, two-thirds of the water that falls as precipitation disappears just, just back into the atmosphere. So the, the remaining one-third is, is divvied up into uh, what, you might also, what you might often hear about is agriculture takes 80% of the water and the cities only take 20% of the water. Well, that's true of this, of this piece of the pie, okay? And there's another piece which is actually what they call environmental water. And by law, a number of rivers have to discharge water to maintain fisheries. Or we like to maintain water flows in the delta. You hear a lot of discussion there about preserving the, the fish and the ecology in the delta because they, want, they need water for that. And if they use water for that, they may not be able to use it for ag and, and city supplies. But by law, there's a lot of this. And also there's uh, you know, a remainder in some years, there's a lot of excess. Some years, some years not. Um, and a lot of that is either goes into extra storage, and that's in groundwater, for example, or it's a discharge to the ocean Un, unused, okay? So um, there's a lot of, uh, when water falls in the state, you know, uh, it goes into, it can go into storage or we often move it around in the state. And, you know, one of the big uh, primary uh, modes of storage is in groundwater basins. Here's a picture of California. You can see here all the orange and yellow areas are uh, areas where there's large groundwater basins and there's a lot of production of water most of it's in the uh, darker orange. In the desert areas, there's still groundwater there. Not a, it's deeper, uh, and there's not as much, but uh, there is groundwater there as well. Um, it's moved around. Uh, you know, there's, there's other modes of storage as well. What I want to say is there's snowpack is another important storage. Uh, you know, when uh, it, it's, it's a large volume of water that sits up uh, in the mountains until April when it starts to melt and come down and fill reservoirs up. And reservoirs, of course, are another mode of storage but they're only finite in their volume. Uh, and of course, there are lakes and, and, and groundwater. Again, uh, it's another uh, artificial kind of groundwater. Now, we move water around in the state. Naturally, it's going to run off in rivers, runs through the delta. And you know, we've built a lot of artificial aqueducts and canals to move water around as well. Um, but uh, I'll go through this picture here. Here's a picture you know, of the snowpack in uh, 2013. That's right. And uh, that's what it looks like. You know, you've been up there skiing and, and snowing and, or when it's snowing and that sort of thing. Again, it's a very important part of the state's water supply. The amount of snowpack on average is equivalent to the, what, the, what all the cities use on an average year. So it's a really important part of the supply. But, you know, it's threatened, you know, uh, what it looks like a year later 
Now, this was a year later, 2014, same point in time in January, hardly any there at all. And I would, I would hesitate to say that the picture today would be about the same. And so we don't have that input to us. So, uh, you know, we have nothing to store, nothing to use. And the question is, is this a, is this a, uh, just a part of a natural drought cycle, or is it you know, something telling us of what's coming in the future with climate change? And the big issue with climate change and snowpack is it's generally accepted to be warmer. And so the warmer it is, the less snow falls, and the more it falls is rain. So there will be less snow in the future with warming climate. So that's something we have to keep thinking about. Um, in terms of moving water around, this is a, a, a picture of the state, again, uh, uh, the, the boxes in the, the, most of the boxes in this picture represent some type of reservoir managed by some type of agency. It could be Folsom Lake, it could be uh, Shasta Lake, it could be Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Uh, a lot of different agencies uh, maintain reservoirs that capture pretty much snow melt. And then, uh, so, and you can see most of these, uh, these facilities are up north. And there's also a lot of aqueducts that move water around. There's the LA Aqueduct, there's the State water projects, there's the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct. Uh, so there's a lot of different conduits and most of those are going down south and feeding the uh, needs in the south. So these are all man-made uh, man uh, bits to help move water around and keep water in the state. And we need to understand how those work a little bit. But uh, this is a close up of the California Delta. Now the Delta is uh, sort of the natural heart of the water supply in California. And it's, uh, by and large, it's mostly a natural uh, you know, layout of, of, of canals and rivers that collect water that, that comes from the north, from the east, and from the south, and normally would all discharge into the San Francisco Bay. Now, since we have reservoirs way up north and way east, like Shasta Dam, and they're collecting water, how do they send water from Shasta, Lake Shasta, to Southern California? As they release it to the Sacramento River, and it flows into the delta, and then they move it into a, a, what they call a four bay unit, which is at the bottom of this picture in the yellow box. Uh, and then they move it into aqueducts. And so there's a close up of the four bay there. And you can see two aqueducts that, in which the water is pumped up to a higher elevation and, a, and it flows by gravity down, down to the valley. And when you get down to the end of the, down to the uh, grapevine, you'll see it actually being pumped over further, some of it. And, and actually you can also see there's a branch of this that sends water to Livermore and to Santa Clara. And in the normal years, if you live in Livermore, a lot of your water, you may say it's delta water, and it's delta water because this is how it gets here. And given this year we're in a drought, we're not getting a lot of the allocation from this source of water, and we're in fact relying a lot on groundwater in the city. So um, I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. Um, again, uh, reemphasize that groundwater is a critical resource. It occupies the pores uh, of underground rocks and geologic materials. It can be, it's ubiquitous, it's found all over the place. You saw the map. Um, it can be found at great depths, down to thousands of feet in some places. Um, typically, the amount of groundwater storage far exceeds the amount of reservoir storage in the state. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, typically we produce it from pumping wells, and we're gonna show you how those things work here. So, um, we have a physical model over here where Aaron is standing, and I'm gonna go through some slides here to show you what it looks like and to identify particular features. And then I'm gonna walk over there and Aaron's gonna do some demos and show it how it works real time, uh, a couple of different times. So really it's a cross section out of the earth, okay? And this is sort of what it looks like if you're just looking at it uh, from the other side of the air from Aaron. You'll see this picture of a live feed here in a minute when you start running some water through the thing. Um, it has a lot of different features. So I'm gonna talk about the, 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 the constituents. You know, there's sand in this thing. That's a, like a geologic material. There's, there's gravel uh, at different layers. There's also a, an important layer of, of clay here, okay? And we identify these things with regard to their properties for water flowing through them, okay? So the, the, the sand area we call a shallow sand aquifer. And, and the word aquifer is uh, you know, used to refer to a formation whose water, water can be transmitted through it very readily. You can pump water out. It's like sucking water out of a, a glass of water. Whereas a clay is a confining layer and, and water does not want to move through clay at all. It's like, you know, you got the thickest milkshake. You, can, you can't get it to even come through a straw. So clay is kind of a barrier to water movement and the sand and gravel are more transmissive units that water can be pumped out of very readily. Um, 
In this case, we also have a feature on the top, like a landfill, and, and, and we'll use that a little bit later to show you uh, what happens when somebody dumps something in there at midnight and nobody's paying attention to them, because it has effects downstream in the lake, potentially. Uh, we have a body there that looks like a lake. Uh, it could also look like a river. We could drain it from the back, but right now it's looking like a lake. And we'll look at a little bit more of that. We have different kinds of wells. We have these small tubes inside this uh, system, and they're meant, to, they're meant to be or operate as wells. So we can pump water out of these wells. We could even pump water in if we wanted to. Uh, we have wells in the shallow aquifer. We have wells in the deep aquifer. And the deep aquifer has the word artesian, and I'll talk to you about what that means in a second. Uh, actually, I'll talk to you right, right about now. There's a third well, which you can't see, which is hidden behind the dotted line here, and it opens up at the top, and what we have is a pipette tip stuck into the hole. And really, this is on dry ground, if you will, above the, the lake rim, okay? And what actually happens is you can actually get water to flow out of that well, if it's a man-made well, or if it's a natural feature or fracture, will flow out of it on its own pressure. We don't have to pump it out. And that means it's a flowing well. And that word artesian well really means a well that flows under its own pressure. And it's named after a, uh, an area in France where this was used quite a lot and they had these kind of conditions. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by the occurrence of groundwater. So this is a zoom in on uh, the right-hand side over where Aaron is standing. And we, it's very hard to see in the sand where the water is. So if you look at the wells, you, know, you can see the water will rise up into the well up to a certain area. Like if I had my, uh, the straw in my glass, I know that the water level in the straw is the same as the water level in the glass around it. Okay? So it's the same trick here. There's going to be water levels in these wells, okay? and you know, right where that white dotted line is. And um, what that means is that below that level, all the pores are filled with water. And above that level, the pores have air in them and some water, okay, but they're not completely saturated. So hydrologists will call the area above the unsaturated zone, and they will call the area below the saturated zone. And the area, the surface that separates them is called the water table. So if the water table is high, there's a lot of water below it. If the water table is low, there's a lot of dry, dry rock or, or partially saturated rock. In this particular case, the water table intersects the lake, so the lake level can be thought of as an extension of the water table. And this is very much, if you've been out to Shadow Cliffs Park, that's exactly what you're seeing. The lake level at Shadow Cliffs is commensurate with the uh, groundwater level, because Shadow Cliffs Park, or that lake, was actually built out of a gravel pit that was extracted out. Okay, so um, the, the shallow, okay, so. Uh, water can actually exchange between the saturated zone and the groundwater system and the lake. Water can go back and forth, as useful to know. Unless, of course, the water level is really low. Now, you imagine yourself out in a desert, and you have a canal going through the desert, and you say, well, I'll show you that in a, in a little bit later. If the canal is unlined, if it's like a ditch, water in a canal will infiltrate, and it will percolate down to the water, water table. And in this case, you can have exchange, but the water and the, water and the groundwater cannot go back up. So here we can lose water out of the canal to the water table, okay? Um, we'll talk a little bit about how water comes and goes, uh, the inputs and outputs to this system. Normally, you know, there's rainfall, and we talked about evapotranspiration, so the first thing that happens is it might rain, and the water will accumulate on the ground or into the roots or into the unsaturated zone. It's going to evaporate back up or transpire back up. That's where most of it goes. Um, but there's going to be a remaining bit that actually makes its way down and actually crosses the water table and it adds water to the storage in the groundwater basin. And that process is called recharge. So there's a recharge of the aquifer. That's how water is, you know, the hydrologic cycle ends up back in groundwater. It's recharged in this way. Um, there are other ways water can come and go into the system. As I said before, it can exchange to and from the lake. In this particular model, we have a reservoir on the left and the right because it's not an infinite infinitely wide model. So you can think of the left side as being, say, up in the high hills or the, where the water tables are higher, and the right side can be down in a valley where there may be another river or something where they maintain the water level at the drainage point. Okay, so there's high water on the left, low water on the right. Um, we can also pull water to this artesian spring, which I told you about. Uh, can actually take water out of the system by, by natural process. 
We can pump water out of the system, and uh, doing so, if, if we pump more water than goes in, the water levels are gonna go down. It's just like drinking water out of a, a glass, you know? Um, uh, so, and actually in some cases, you, you might even put water into the system, you know? Sometimes people recycle water, we've talked about that, and they can recycle it and use the groundwater aquifer as a reservoir, and they can put it back in. That doesn't happen often, but it, it, it's, a, it's a newer thing that's, uh, that people are doing these days. So, as I said before, as I said before, you know, we have high water on the left, low water on the right, and it, you know, it tends to want to drive a flow through the system. I have a little uh, hose here, okay? And in the hose, I have water level over here, and I have a water level over here. And typically, what you see is they want to be at the same level, okay? There's equilibrium. And if I raise this side, this side's gonna equilibrate very quickly, okay? And what happens in a real system is it doesn't equilibrate that fast. Water will flow through that system, but very slowly, like 10 meters a year. Now imagine, hold imagine. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We don't wanna uh, get water everywhere. Uh, Safety first. She thinks first. I'm gonna get water. She th imagine this being the ground surface, and this being high, and I've got the water up here. So now there's a pressure here, okay? There's a pressure here, and if this is the ground surface for my thumb, I can let the water will come out all by itself under its own pressure. Now you can see, reason water is coming out of here because there's a weight of water over here driving it over. So when you see an artesian well or a spring, it's working the exact same way, okay? We're gonna do this in the real model. Well, what if I were to connect all the shallow wells, the water levels, I'm gonna get the water table here. And what if, and, and that's the kind of flow you're gonna get through the system, okay? Now, I can also go through and connect and look at the water levels in the deep wells. Now, notice they're different. And in fact, what's gonna happen is that's gonna drive water out the artesian well because it can't go anywhere else. It wants to rise up to the same level as it started. And that level happens to be above ground. I think the first thing we wanted to do here was pump some water out of the system, okay? Now, which well shall we use? Well, let's see here. I think we wanna use the pumping well. This is a big one for a, like a city well. Is that big, why it's got that big square thing? Yeah, it's a big opening where water comes in at many different elevations. Now you might see there's some, there's some tracer here that she put in here. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but that might influence what happens in this, this pumping well. Go ahead and pump Let's that one. Let's see. Light. Oh my, it takes a lot of energy to pull this water out. Now do you see the water levels going down at all? Did they go down? I don't know. I mean the water level in the well is right about here. Well, why don't you pump, uh, do that again. I'll see the water level here. Maybe you might be able to see water levels going down. And pulling. Maybe the water up. level is going down over here while she's pumping. Oh, it's also starting to get red. Uh-oh. So what you're seeing here is you're actually influencing how the water is flowing through the system. And hold on one second. Uh -huh. The idea here in this red here, she put it in here originally as a way to, to show you how the water moves. So when she, it, when she started, it was over here, and naturally it's wanting to move across the system as I explained, because the water's high and the water's low, okay? So let's, uh, she's pumping the water out. Let's pump this one. This is also a shallow well, isn't it? Yes, but let's it keep an eye on a water level in a city well. Okay, they're both shallow, just a little bit different. It's what you can see is a water level in a city well. The city well is now dry because she's pumping. So imagine, you know, uh, I, I operate the wells for the city, everything's fine, and she's just got this winery going. She's <laughs> pumping all the groundwater out, and our city water supply has now been eliminated because of all this water. So water wells can influence one another and how they're operated and they have this uh, sort of drawdown effect. Now let's go down and pump the deep well, okay? She's built a new well, it's deeper, and the idea is she doesn't want to affect the city and it probably will not affect. Is that because it's isolated by the confining layer? Yes, it's below the clay layer. So the effects on the city well are not too significant because she's pumping out of a deeper area that's hydraulically separated, okay? Okay. I think that's it. Now, I think what we, what we want to do is she's going to go along and connect, like we had the purple line up here, or the, we had the, pur the purple well, the shallow wells. She's going to connect and mark the water levels in all the shallow wells, okay? Okay, so let's see, shallow wells. Not this one that's deep. So here we've got a shallow well. Right. And here we've got a shallow well. So I think there's some water up here. Is there a bubble? Yeah, I've got a bubble in there. Well, you could get the next one off. I'll get the new one. Here's another that. one and another. That's deep. Oh, really? There we go. Okay. Much better. Okay. That's deep and shallow and shallow. So if you connected those dots. If I connect the dots, now this one needs to yeah. still settle in, so I'm going to skip right, it for the moment. Skip that one. Just skip that one. 
and connecting the dots. Hey, it has a downward slope. What should I do? Should I bring it down to the lake level? Yes, because that's probably where it's connected because there's no water up here. But there's that water, but that's, that's different. Okay. And then it goes all the way down to the lower right. exit, correct? Right. So we can sort of see that the water levels in a well are commensurate, draw a line between the left and the right. And that is, uh, you know, that, that's sort of a hydraulic rating. It's driving water through the system. Um, and since we know that, and if we, you know, normally we don't have this perspective on what the groundwater systems look like. All we have is the wells and the depths to water. So if we wanted to drill a new well right here, we might anticipate the water to be where the line is because we've done all this interrogation. Now she's going to go along and, and draw the water levels in the deep wells. With the green pen. So, oh, they're much higher. They're higher. Yeah, that's very interesting. Okay. And, and, and just sort of draw them. And you can sort of see the water levels in the deep wells are higher. Oh, and can I, should I draw this one for the uh, Yeah, and we actually tip? have this pipette tip. So draw the water level as though, as though there was a water level there. So you can sort of see that the water levels in the deep well follow sort of a different surface because the water level rises up. And what you, want, what you really see is the water wants to go down here, wants to go into the clay layer. It's not, it's not connected to this. The only way for it to go out is to rise up here. So again, it wants to seek an equilibrium, and it sort of has an equilibrium because there's a little water meniscus there that I think you can see. Now, I think if Aaron is able to pull that out, before you do it, Assuming. I want you to keep your, eye, keep your eyes on the water that will be coming out of that well when the pipette is not there. It will be flowing all by itself. So it's very subtle. See if you can see it. Oh, there right, it so goes. you see the water coming out? And, and you put if it I back put back in, in, it fills right back up. It fills right back up. Okay, so that's actually how a spring works. It flows all by itself, just like I demonstrated with the tube. And so the, the, a spring can be a natural formation, or a spring can be, or, or we can actually drill a well and it will flow all by itself. And I think what we're going to do now is just do a quick, quick a drought exercise. We're going to turn the water off. Aha. Uh -huh. No more water. No more water. And I think... Uh, we still need to take water out of the system. Yeah, so, you know, we still, even though it's not raining, we still have our needs for water. So we're going to be pumping the water. Okay, so let's pump some water. Let's um, pump. And it might take a while for her to do this. You might want to pump the Ooh. city well. That'll take more... That'll more take, out per... That'll take more out per unit energy, I think. Takes so much energy to pump this. Well, now you're going to get all this contamination coming out, too. That's what I was trying we're to We're going to talk about that. So remember that picture when you get back to it, okay? Hmm, what's going to happen to the lake level while I'm doing this? I don't know. I, I would imagine since there's nothing going into the system and you're pulling water out, that the water levels are going to go down, just like if I were to drink my water and empty it out because nothing's going in. Normally, when you drink a glass of water, you don't have water going in at the same time. I hope there aren't any fish swimming. Is, yeah, okay. Well, that's not too good. So actually, we can see right now that the water level is now down to here. Okay, so the net effect of a lot of pumping is to reduce the water levels. And or when combined with lack of rainfall input, the water levels go down, okay? Uh -huh, so the, lake is almost, the lake is almost dry, and I think I, I've made the point, okay? So I think our next step is to reestablish re our... Oh, uh, uh, here comes the spring rainstorm. Yeah, thank goodness. That's what we need. Okay, to summarize what we saw is that, you know, you can get water well pump, it can do a lot of things. You know, it can give you fluctuations between one well and another. If you're competing for water, it can dry wells up. Over large areas and over a long time, you can reduce the storage, the stored water, the water stored in the groundwater, so the volume of water stored goes down. You can dry up a lot of areas. You could potentially dry up lakes and shallow water bodies or wetlands. There's other impacts such as ecological or what we call subsidence issues and subsidence is a situation where you remove a lot of water from a normally saturated rock or sands or gravels and without that water in there the weight of the geologic material will want it to settle and compact and what that means is the surface elevations of the ground can go down that's called subsidence that happens in a lot of spots and there's also these ideas of ecological impacts I'll have a picture of that in a second so one thing I want to do is Normally when I've done this, I bring up Google Earth and I do all these tours, but I think I want to take you uh, to a couple of places and show you some pictures where some of these things are, 
are, are in, in play. And the first place I want to go to is Africa. And I want to go to the country called Libya. And I want to focus our attention in the blue box. And that's all I'm going to show you here. But I will say there in Libya, they have the so-called Nubian sandstone aquifer. Now, Libya is a country that's about that's a little bit more wet than, say, Saudi Arabia. But most of the water in Libya, 95%, is not from seawater desalination. It's from groundwater. And you might ask yourself, well, where does all that groundwater come from if the, most of this country is in the Sahara Desert? And I'll tell you, it's coming from the Sahara Desert. And you say, well, why is that? And it's because there is a large body of, a large aquifer underneath there that was filled with water thousands of years ago. And the climate has since changed. It was, it was a, an aquifer back when the Sahara Desert wasn't a desert. And so the water stayed, and nobody pumped it out until now. Um, you can bring this over. Uh, if you go to Libya now, you can actually buy this water, at least uh, when I was there. And this, uh, what they do is they produce this water, this ancient water. It's been dated to be, in some places, over a million years old. So it was a million years ago when that water entered or recharged that aquifer. It's been sitting down there ever since. And now what they're doing in Libya is 75% uh, of their water is being pumped out of these aquifers in the south, and they're piped to the northern cities where all the population is, in this case, say, Tripoli. They have a large network of four-meter diameter pipes, and they move the water up, and they're essentially mining the water because it's not getting recharged or replenished. So when I was there, the, the obvious question is, well, how long is that going to last? And nobody, I never got the same answer twice. So honestly, I don't know. But it's been working so far. They only have 6 million people in Libya. But that's kind of interesting. Now, I, uh, uh, I had some pictures of this, but what, what I wanted to take you to, over to the green area. The green area is uh, an area where this same kind of aquifers exist. And we're going to zoom in um, uh, close in. There's, there, are, there are lakes. So in the same sense, I have a lake here. Uh, there are lakes out in the Sahara Desert. And you say, well, where does that water come from? And that water comes from that aquifer. It's just collinear with the aquifer because there's no rainfall in the Sahara Desert that's appreciable. So that's it. And what does that look like? It looks like that. So there's, a, there's an oasis. So if you're traveling over the, you know, you read all these stories, Lawrence of Arabia over in Saudi Arabia or over here in the Sahara Desert, here is an oasis where the groundwater appears above the ground surface you have all the plants, you have birds, you have lots of bugs, you have a whole ecology out here, okay? So I'm gonna to go to a different place now. So the different place is Jordan. This is in the Middle East. Now Jordan gets all their ground, all their water from groundwater too, although there's a lot more precipitation in Jordan in general, but it's still dry, a dry climate. And uh, I'm gonna focus in on the red box, okay? Uh, and um, the red box, and now, now we gotta close, close in again. The biggest city in Jordan, the capital, is Amman. Amman has been growing tremendously over the past decades. And they have built uh, water pipelines and wells further and further from the city. One of the places they focused on is the area in the red, which is a, an area where there was an oasis called the Azraq Oasis. And it was an area where the water actually bubbled up uh, above the ground surface because the terrain was lower there. It's the bottom of a kind of a basin and the water would collect there. But it was the same kind of thing as Libya. But the problem is now it looks like this because all the water has been drained. So you saw me pumping the water out over here and the water levels went down. That's what happened here at this oasis. So what was living there and all the life that was there, a lot of it is now gone. And you can sort of see this, was, this is the way it was in 1998. All the water is drained and the uh, palm trees are hanging on for dear life. But it's not coming back. Okay? So... Um, I have another picture. I'm going to switch, switch gears a couple of pictures. I, I mentioned subsidence. You know, you pull all this water out and the ground goes down, okay? And you say, well, how significant is that? Well, the most, I think the most uh, dramatic picture of this effect is shown here in the San Joaquin Valley where the man is standing uh, next to a large pole in 1977. You can see where the ground layer is. But in 1925, the ground layer was at the top of the picture. So the ground was a lot higher then, and it has gone down. That's one of the most dramatic. Usually you're looking at uh, you know, maybe a couple of feet over uh, tens of years, that sort of thing, when you see it. Uh, but we can actually see it a lot better now because we can utilize satellite uh, techniques. It's called uh, uh, the INSAR satellites. And basically it's a radar kind of based 
uh, remote sensing technique where you can actually measure the ground elevation from uh, a pass of the satellites in one year and come by three years later and measure the ground surface elevation later and you can measure changes in the elevation millimeters or more, okay? And so people have done this a lot, a lot of places, a lot of cities in the southwest. You can see a lot of very subtle sub subsidence going on. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, the next slide is going to show you uh, something which is not subsidence, but it's another satellite technique used to try to estimate from a remote point of view at a satellite level how much groundwater has been extracted from uh, you know, a large area. So you might think to yourself, well, if I can measure the groundwater levels and visualize it the way I've done here, I can see how the groundwater is going down and I can see how the water's been pulled out of storage. Some places you may not have all that information. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get all the data. So the NASA has a satellite called the GRACE satellite, and GRACE is a satellite that measures gravity, gravitational attraction. And so what they do is the satellite passes over a region a couple of different times, uh, in this case, uh, six years apart, and they can actually measure differences of gravity. And uh, a, recent, a professor down at UC Irvine has utilized this information and to attribute that gravitational change to the loss of water pulled out of the ground over that period. So you can sort of see that in India, a lot of people have built a lot of wells, they put a lot of water out, no one's been keeping track of it, and no one really has an idea of what the net impact was until you look at it from this perspective, okay? So I think this is really kind of interesting that you can actually see groundwater from satellites when you don't have the data on the ground, okay? And they've done this in California as well. So um, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. What's my timing here? So, uh, I want to talk a little bit about groundwater quality. We've talked about how groundwater occurs, how it comes from rain, how we put it in the ground, how it comes out. But the other aspect about groundwater is it has a lot of constituents in it. You know, a lot of times people, you know, you, you drink mineral water. You know, you look at the side of this and it has a, a notation of bicarbonate and all sorts of minerals that are inside of this water that have been measured. Uh, and a lot of these minerals occur because of the geology, these things are soluble and they get into the water. Uh, and those are, imp I, 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 you know, if they're natural, I think of them as impurities, I use that word. Uh, you know, they can include minerals, calcium, chloride, all these sorts of things. Some of them are little, some of them can be poisonous if they're concentrated enough, like selenium, arsenic. These are things that happen in California water, but they're never really high enough to be a, an issue. But you can keep an eye on them. And then um, you'll also find atmospheric gases. You know, if you have fish, have to have oxygen, and they survive on oxygen that's dissolved in the water. So there's atmospheric, uh, atmosphere exchanges, uh, it's gases with the water, and there's certain solubilities of water. You can also find salt. So a lot of times if you have a groundwater basin near the ocean, you know, underneath the ocean floor, if you drill, went down, you'd find salt water in most cases. There's actually an exception to that, but there's salt water down there. And so, um, if you go over to the land side and drill a well down, you'll find fresh water. So if you connect a line between those two wells, somewhere in there is going to be some, some shift from salinity to fresh water. And if you pump the well on the land side to get all the fresh water, at some point you might suck in all that salt water, just as Aaron did with the red water here. Okay? So then you can pollute the well with seawater. It's called seawater intrusion. Okay? So uh, groundwater pollution is more the kind of things that we as, uh, as, as a human species have dumped chemicals and had practices on a land surface that have led to pollution of the groundwater. These things could be from agriculture, from irrigation, from industries, big and small. They can be from urban runoff. You have a lot of rainfall in cities. You got all this stuff running off into creeks and a lot of stuff might find its way into groundwater. Uh, you could have uh, wastewater from sewage treatment plants or bad septic systems. All of these things, and of course the seawater intrusions, all of these things conspire to add some kind of pollution to the groundwater. This particular picture was, uh, I was on a, a project where we were trying to work with people in Kazakhstan in Central Asia, and they have a very important metallurgical uh, facility there that does a lot of really important work with uranium and beryllium products, uh, one of the biggest suppliers of beryllium in the world, yet they have, it's an industry and they have a waste stream, and this waste stream as you can see, some of it's dumped into this uh, pond here. And the question that they had was they didn't have a lot of experience with groundwater pollution. 
And the question was, yeah, we think we've got this pond lined and there's clay underneath it, but we also think it's leaking. It's getting into the aquifer. We, don't, you know, we want to work with you to figure out how it works. And so we ended up working with them on this. And so that's what that picture is from. So um, uh, we're going to show you, again, back to the, uh, back to the uh, uh, device here, the, the, the ant farm, if you will. We're going to pollute it up some more and show you some ideas of how pollution gets underground. Um, one, one way is, uh, I call it deep well injection, you know. I think she showed you some, uh, she showed you, she's gonna do it again. We started out by pumping some red dye down, uh, down one of these wells. And you can think of that as a, that dye may be a contaminant or something, somebody wanted to get rid of something and they dumped it in deep wells. Do you think anybody would be smart enough to keep doing that? I don't know. But that is a way that people have done it. They've gotten rid of stuff, they think, the wa they, they think it's gonna be isolated from the, the shallow regime or isolated from some other places where they're producing water. And a lot of times people don't understand how these systems communicate, how what I do over here affects what happens over here. Uh, pump a treat is actually cleaning the water out. You, know, so you saw Aaron pulling water out of the system, all the red water. You know, people have this idea, if I just keep pumping all this water out, I can get it all out of there. And that's a great expense. You know, we have a landfill disposal. So there's also the landfill here, and she's dumped some stuff in the landfill. We're gonna see what happens to that. Um, and there's also a lot of chemistry. I won't talk a lot about this. I have one little thing I'll show you, but it's not just, you know, colored dyes moving through groundwater. There's lots of chemistry that can occur. Uh, there's also lots of uh, different kinds of fluids. You can have gasolines and products that don't mix well with water, and they form little bubbles, and, and they float and they exchange liquids and you know, it's all very kind of a complicated thing. You know, I, uh, uh, so it, it can go on and on and on. We'll just show you how some of this works. I think we're gonna go to the mop. So let's walk over here. Why don't you give me your water and I'll put it back away. No, I'm saving this, okay. Don't wanna lose that, it's precious. Shall I re-inject? Yeah, so, lots of waste. well, first of all, she's going to re-inject here, but one of the things before you do it, what, you got blue in oh, there? Oh, wow, I have, where'd no, the blue come from? No, no, you don't want that. No, I don't want that. But one thing I will point out is she actually dumped some stuff in here at the beginning, and you saw it moving through here, okay? And you saw how this well is polluted, okay? And you saw here how she's put some stuff in a landfill, and maybe I should use this, and how it's actually moving right along the top, right, right along the top here, and it's going to move its way into the lake. Is it actually coming in there now? Here. Yep. Starting yeah, so it's actually coming into the lake. So she did that. And she did this before. You can sort of see there was a leftover of stuff in a well here. It's just been bleeding out. Now she's doing another, another disposal of this chemical here, okay? Uh -huh. I don't want to pay to get rid of it. I'm just yeah. going to shove it down. Yeah, it's midnight. It's midnight. But now the city well, we've got to turn the city well back on, as we, we did this before. Yeah, you know. Oh, I'll dump it over there. It's far enough away from my house. Now I'm gonna take a shower. Okay. Uh-oh, not good. So that's not too good, okay? So that, that's how we discover these problems half the time, is a well becomes polluted. And all we know is that this well is polluted. We don't know what's going on at this well right next door. What if we pump the water next door? Let's see what happens. What happens here? This one right here. Let's move the tip. You can see what's gonna happen, but normally you won't happen? know, okay? Mm, I think it's deep enough. Right? Ooh, nice and clean. All right, so it's clean. So we're getting red out of this one, and, and we know that there's this landfill over here. Do you think, you think we would uh, assume that this red here is coming from this landfill? I don't know. I mean, I, you can tell right now that this red is coming from over here, and that was a secret. The landfill is polluting this. So there's two different sources, and the real question is how do you make, how do you figure out what's going on, okay? So uh, it, it's a tricky business, but this shows you pretty obviously how well things work. Uh, what you can also see is there's a little bit of red here left over from the show at 9.30 this morning. So it does take a while to get some of this stuff out. If she were to try to eliminate and pump this well, we might want to see, can we get rid of it all? You know, this is, sometimes at, at the lab they have a, a large contamination problem because it used to be a naval base. They used a lot of solvents. Solvents are readily evaporate. You might think, if I, if I just dump something on the ground, it's going to evaporate and go away into the atmosphere. But a lot of times it will get into the underground and it will stay there and it will mix with the water. And, you know, you worry about concentrations in parts per billion on some of these things in terms of their health impacts. 
So what, what you're, oh, you're getting a lot of it out of there, but it's still here. It's not having any impact here. But what happens in doing this is there's a volume of water in storage that is no longer available for public use. So people worry and you try to protect it. Okay, and really what we have learned is uh, try not to let it happen in the first place. There's a, a saying that's been very popular, you know, in a consultant crowd, gets a chuckle once in a while that the solution to pollution is dilution. And in some sense, there, there's some sense to that. Sometimes people want to address these problems by just letting them go and they become dilute because you can sort of see the things become spread out and they, they become dilute. Uh, well, there's another, there's another statement that's been, been made and it was made in error, but I think it has some truth to it or some, some reality or interpretation, which is the solution to pollution is delusion. So maybe if I kind of steer somebody's in inquiry the wrong way or I don't let them figure it all out, uh, I can save myself. Well, I think really the, uh, the approach is that the solution to pollution, if you will, is to really understand how things are working, like we're trying to show you here, understand the causes, the impacts, how the system behaves, you know, uh, if you will, the fluid mechanics uh, of the uh, subsurface. And so, and, and to use that to not let it happen in the first place. And essentially a lot of that's happening because what you see is there's a lot of rules, there's EPA, there's water quality regulations, there's, you know, it, it's very complicated with red tape, but it's all designed to try to not let this happen. Now, you know, we can go up into hazardous waste disposal areas, there's proper ways to deal with things, and in the past there weren't. So uh, the next thing I want to show you is uh, we don't have time for all these videos or all, all, all these kind of demos. I'm going to show you some high-speed pictures, uh, your time-lapse pictures of a couple of situations like I've just shown you here. And in this particular case, there's a landfill you can see that has uh, some, some red in it and I actually put a blue in that, uh, that deeper, shallow well there. And we can see what happens as they go along, okay? And you can sort of see how uh, the red is moving in to the lake and the blue is moving not as quickly for some reason, but it's moving to the right. And so uh, we started to see the red going to the lake here as well, okay? So uh, the next one I wanna show you is a situation where we have the red there, and this is very much similar to what um, Aaron had already started to show you, but you can sort of see as a lake, it's gonna eventually wanna go to the right, and it's gonna, it's gonna empty itself out in the uh, right-hand side uh, reservoir. Now, I'm gonna show you the exact same thing again, except in this case, I'm gonna operate the lake as a river. So really what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna operate a drainage behind it. Water will drain out of the river. So there'll be two ways water can leave the system, through the river, or leave groundwater, through the river or the right-hand side um, uh, reservoir. So in this case, that same uh, injection is in fact going to find its way into the river and leave that way. So in this case, you can sort of see how the water will communicate with the surface water. I can get a pollution in the river that's coming from a groundwater pollution somewhere else, or vice versa. It can work the other way as well. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I, I think Aaron's got a, a beaker of some red there. Yep, right here. All We're going to talk about here. a situation where you have, say, two kinds of contaminants. A lot of times you have many contaminants. Okay, she's going to put some blue, blue in the red. And what do red and blue make? Purple, all right. So my, my, my uh, question that I want Erin to do is I want her to take that beaker home with her tonight and come back. And, and, Gee, exciting. And, yeah, I want you to come back tomorrow. And you guys can come and see. I want her to split that water into two sub-volumes. Half the water in this beaker, half the water in another beaker. But I want beaker one to only be red, and I want beaker two to only be blue. Now, do you think she'll figure out how to do that? I don't know. I think I could do some chromatography. At chromatography. <laughs> okay. Now, you've got to use the same water. You can't fake it and recreate it. So the interesting thing is I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the, uh, a time-lapse picture here, if you will, of the red and blue mixture into uh, the well, uh, one of these, to that well, and we're going to watch what happens, okay? So... It's a little more dilute, so keep your eye on it. But I think what you can see is that the red and the blue separate out. The red moves faster than the blue. So how does that work? Because it's just riding on the piggyback of the groundwater, and that just goes at a certain rate. Why does one go faster than the other? I'm going to show that again, I think. 
Nope. So right there, the big well is pumping red, and then it's pumping blue, and then it's clean, or still blue. Okay, well, we're going to go back and look at that again. I'm going to do it one more time. Okay, now, keep an eye on the, the pumping well, the big one that she's always pumping, the big thick one. If I'm pumping water out of it right now, it's, it's fresh water. Okay? And if I'm pumping now, it's red. Now I'm going to get blue. So in time, if I have a time, you know, I look and I get a time, it's fresh, then it's red, then it's blue. How do I make sense of this? You know, if I'm a guy at the lab working at the Water Supply Authority, how do I interpret that? And so what's really going on here is the blue is reactive. And the mixture of red and blue, what it does is it, at the molecular level, the blue molecules want to stick to the sand molecules, but not all of it. So there's, you know, some of them wants to be, uh, they want blue and water, there's an equilibrium. So, but the net effect of this is the blue is going to move slower than the water because it's hung up with all this reaction. And so uh, the guy at the lab, when he takes samples of this, and if he doesn't have a water quality laboratory himself, at the water agency, if you will, they'll send it to a laboratory, they'll probably use a device that has the word chromatograph in it. And they'll, in fact, sample or run the water through a system that forces it to actually come out at different points at different times. And that's how they can tell different chemicals have different behaviors. So um, that's how that works. Um, what's the next one? OK, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. And I'm going to go do a couple of examples, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some other areas. I'm going to focus here on the Imperial Valley in California, tell you a little story about an Imperial Valley is in a blue box down there, down by the Salt Sea, if anybody's been there. It's inland from San Diego. Um, you can see the Salt Sea above there. One thing you notice here is that in the middle of the desert, there's a lot of agriculture. And the agriculture is big business, especially in the winter. A lot of things come out of there for the East Coast and uh, much of the country because it's the only place where they can grow stuff in the winter. And uh, the water for all that agriculture is imported from the Colorado River. This is what I talked about in the beginning. And there's a canal that runs from the Colorado River to the Imperial Valley. Originally, when it was built, it was a ditch. It was an unlined ditch and a lot of water. And guess what? They lost a lot of water to the subsurface. So uh, what, here's the All-American Canal. And they didn't like all this because they were losing all this water that was intended for the agriculture in the Imperial Valley. And what happened is it kind of built up a little mound on the groundwater. And people uh, down south of that yellow line started putting wells in and growing, uh, starting their own agriculture there off this groundwater that was accruing. Now, the interesting part of the story is that yellow line is the Mexican border. So the people on the Mexico side were taking advantage of this water. You know, this got people all very upset, you know. So they ended up, in, in this picture, you can sort of see there's two canals because one, they're rebuilding it. They rebuilt it now. It's all done. And they've lined it. So there's no more water loss from the well. So they didn't want to have any water loss from the well to the subsurface. Uh, they wanted it all to go to the beneficial use. That's the buzzword for the uh, irrigation. So uh, now we're going to shift gears, okay? We're going to contrast that situation with what's going on in Orange County. Orange County is a big part of Southern California, and there's in that yellow box, you might have between two and three million people living. And um, they get water from all over the place, but one of the places they get a lot of water from is their groundwater system. And one of the things they do with that groundwater system is they artificially put water underground. So what you can see here is a whole bunch of infiltration basins where water from various sources, and I'll explain one of them, they put it underground on purpose. So in contrast to what's going on in, in the Imperial Valley, they want the water to go into the underground, and they want to store it in the groundwater basin. And one of the sources for the water that goes into these, to these, these uh, pits you know, so, so, so is, is, in fact, the, comes from the Orange County Sanitation District, which is in Fountain Valley. And really, what, what goes on there is they got one of the most advanced water treatment systems in the world. Uh, and they pump a lot of that water back up, and it gets put into the ground in those, in those basins, OK? So what you have is water gets used, it gets treated, it goes, it's put back into the groundwater reservoir, it gets used, it gets treated, and it's going around and around. So it's a nice recycling and reuse. And what that means is the amount of water that they, they take from here will satisfy the needs of four to 500,000 people just from this. And that's a water they don't have to import from, from snowpacks that don't exist and reservoirs that are dry. 
So it kind of gets, gets, gets them off that old, old school grid a little bit. And so this is actually a, a new way of thinking about how to manage groundwater, okay? They say, well, uh, is, is it only in Southern California? Well, a lot of it is. A lot of the very forward thinking ways of doing this have started down there, but you know, let, let's come to Livermore. You know, I said that a lot of our water comes here in Livermore from the Delta, okay? And we talked about the South Bay Aqueduct. And uh, what they do in years when they have water in the South Bay Aqueduct and they buy water and they can get extra water is they take some of it and they drop it into the Arroyo Mocho and that will take it downtown between Livermore and Pleasanton. And you can see another set of these kinds of basins that are here. These are the old gravel pits uh, down there. And you know, Shadow Cliffs is there in the south. It looks like a uh, kind of a triangle. That's the park. But they put water underground here too. In addition to what the normal rainfall gives you, okay? so. Uh, this year, for example, they're getting very little contribution to the water here from the delta, if any at all, okay? And what, is, uh, what we're surviving on is groundwater. And so what we're surviving on uh, in, in large part is water, a lot of that is what we put down there in the good years, okay? So we're actually using the groundwater as a reservoir, okay? So uh, they're not recycling it the way you've done in South Southern California. Once this groundwater is used, some of it will end up in this particular treatment plant. Uh, there's one in Pleasanton and there's one in Livermore, but this particular one in Pleasanton will treat water. And what they do with some of that treated water is they pipe it up into San Ramon and to Danville and to Dublin to water golf courses and schoolyards. Okay, so it's, re it's, 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 it's reused. It's not necessarily recycled because it doesn't ever come back into the system but they're reusing it and they're making the most out of it. And the uh, Livermore Golf Course, for example, is the same thing is going on there. They get water from the Livermore Treatment Facility. So this idea of recharging the groundwater and reusing water and recycling water, to me, is, is, is something we need to you know, become more familiar with. I think it's a really important thing and they've done a lot of this. Santa Clara now, I think, is building a very large facility for treating water in the same way. And so, um, I guess I'm, I'm coming to the end, but I'm not almost, I've got one slide after this, but it's, uh, I wanted just to review, we, we tried, at least I tried to explain, you know, how our water, how we get our water in California, where it comes from. Um, and I wanted to explain how groundwater works. It's in the news a lot these days, so hopefully you can sort of see how some of, it, how some of these things work here now. Um, it's, it's actually quite important. It's probably more important than people give it credit for, um, especially now here in Livermore, because we're living off a lot of it. Um, there's a lot of threats to groundwater quality, you know, dumping things in wells and all this stuff. And, you know, it still kind of occurs, I think, in some cases. Uh, but I think we're much more aware of things. And, uh, you know, I think more people are aware of, of what they do before they do it, you know. Um, and the idea is how can we better protect it and use it in the future? I hope we got some ideas of that. Now, the last slide I have is something I hadn't planned on here, but I saw it in the newspaper on February 1st, I thought, I thought, you know, gosh, are we there yet? You know, and here, here's a picture where they're talking about oil waste being pumped into the aquifers uh, in the state and in, in the San Joaquin Valley. And I'm going, why would they ever want, I mean, this is almost nonsensical, nonsensical to me, that this is even being talked about and people are still doing this kind of thing. But it, 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 it you need to keep thinking that, uh, you know, we, we, we need, keep abreast of this and be diligent about these things. Because it's still, people still worry about this stuff and it still happens. And the only thing I would say in closing is that I, I would say that, you know, 50 years ago, this, uh, this probably was occurring as well, but it never would have made page one. So there's a little bit of progress. Right? But this is only three weeks ago, okay? Um, and so with that, I think it's time for Q&A. So thanks for your attention. How are we doing? Yeah.